<laughs> Here I am with Dean Owners again. We had a great conversation last time, and today I'm going to be asking him about epigenetics. So thank you so much, Dr. Dean Ornish. Great to be on your show again. I so appreciate it. Awesome. And so epigenetics is sort of a complicated, abstract concept. So if you could explain it in simple terms to people that don't know what it is. You know, when I went to medical school, I was taught that the only way you could change your genes is to change your parents, you know, and which is obviously impossible, uh, that you're stuck with them. And I can't tell you how many patients have said things to me like, oh, I've just got bad genes. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, in fact, even I've been working with former President Bill Clinton since 1993 when Hillary Clinton asked me to help train the chefs that to train the chefs to cook for them at the White House and later Camp David and Air Force One and the Navy Mess and so on. And and he followed the program pretty well, but then with all the political stuff going on, he kind of got off it. And then 10 years ago, his bypasses clogged up and one of his cardiologists held a press conference and said, oh, it's all in his genes and his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And having worked with him for so many years, I knew it had everything to do with it. So I sent him a note and I said, look, the friends that I value the most are the ones who tell me what I need to hear, not what I just want to hear. And you need to know that it's not all in your genes. And I say that not to blame you, but to empower you. Because if it were all in your genes, then you'd be a victim and you're one of the most powerful guys on the planet. And I thought, well, maybe I'll never hear from him again. But he, he got back. We, we met a few days later and he's now been doing this reversal program that, that I write about in, in the new book and that we've been studying for 40 years. And this is Dr. Ornish's new book, Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases. Definitely check it out the link is in the description below again whatever your politics i think it's a it's a um, great example for someone to who especially was known for not eating a particularly healthy diet or lifestyle to, to begin doing all these things and he's been doing it great for the last 10 years and he's doing well because what i shared with him is that our genes are, are a predisposition but our genes are not our fate and i did a study with craig venter years ago who was the first to decode the human genome and um, we found that in just three months, over 500 genes were changed, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes. It's not that you're actually changing your genes, but you're changing the switches that turn those genes off and on through a process called methylation or different proteins called histone and non-histone proteins that act as switches. There are things that are called sirtuins that are uh, enzymes that wrap your DNA away around DNA around these histone proteins as a way of turning off the harmful genes. That's why they're called sirtuins. It's an acronym for something like silencing uh, information regulator. They're like anti-aging proteins, uh, and and a lot of good research has been done in that because um, because they really play an important role in the aging process and. In, in so many chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, etc. So if you have a gene, for example, that can cause an oncogene that can promote prostate, breast, or colon cancer, we found that we could turn off those genes, over 500 genes in three months, turning off the bad genes that cause us to get sick, and turning on the good genes that cause us to get healthy. And why that's and and then it's been found through a process of called epigenetics, which you asked about, that when you change your genes in yourself, it actually gets passed on to your kids as well. So it's not only helping you, but it's helping your offspring, which is I think a pretty exciting thing. And it shows one of the themes of of my new book, which is that how dynamic these mechanisms are and how quickly you can get better or worse if you make these changes. It, it also shows that, and one of the radical, I mean, the radical unifying theory that that we present in this new book. I co-wrote this with my my lovely wife and partner of many 20 years, uh, Anne, Anne Ornish, that I was trained like most doctors, all doctors really, uh, to view heart disease and diabetes and prostate and breast and colon cancer and Alzheimer's and all these conditions as being different diseases, different diagnoses, different treatments. But this radical theory that we're presenting is that, this unifying theory, is that they're really the same disease manifesting and masquerading in different forms. And I say that because they all share these same underlying biological mechanisms, which include the epigenetics, but also chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, in telomeres, in gene expression, as we've talked about, in uh, angiogenesis, and so on. And each of these mechanisms is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have, or to reduce it even further to, you know, eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And these genes that control all these different mechanisms can be turned off or turned on, sometimes in a matter of hours and certainly within a matter of weeks, by these lifestyle choices that we make and how quickly you can feel better or worse in ways that we can actually measure. And again, these get passed on to your kids as well. 
that's pretty that's pretty impressive and crazy in, in just a few hours so i'm just so curious as like what is actually happening in your body so like you're all of a sudden deciding to go from eating a standard american diet being sedentary to having like an active healthier lifestyle with you know a whole food plant-based vegan diet whatever so so what's actually happening it's like your body's like oh this food's good this thing i'm doing is good so let's just let's just flip that switch like do we know why you can change this so quickly yeah well we don't know all the reasons but we know a lot more than we used to and these 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 mechanisms are so dynamic in both directions you can get better quickly you can get worse quickly and i think just before we get into the the actual biochemical mechanisms of this the the larger context is that so many people think you know if i change my diet it's to prevent something bad from happening years down the road and that's not that's not a sustainable motivator uh, fear of dying will get your attention for a month or so, but it's not sustainable because, you know, we all we're, we all know at some point we're going to die. The mortality rate is 100 percent; it's one per person. But we don't think about it most of the time because it's too scary. And so I've just learned that efforts to try to motivate people to change out of fear are not really sustainable. And I think that's true for global warming. I used to get in discussions with Al Gore about this. Uh, I saw him recently a few days ago. Uh, you know, that, that, that when the inconvenient truth came out, it got every, galvanized everybody's attention. But people stopped talking about it because, you know, the idea that we may all die, you know, in 10 years is just too scary. So people just tune it out. But when you make these changes, for precisely because these biochemical mechanisms, including the epigenetics, are so dynamic, most people feel so much better so quickly in ways that really matter to them. It really reframes the whole reason from change, for changing from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy and pleasure and love and feeling good, which are. So within hours, your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep, you, you can grow so many new brain neurons in a process called neurogenesis, your brain can get measurably bigger, particularly those parts of your brain that you want to get bigger, like in what's called the hippocampus, it controls memory. Uh, and we can talk later about this new study we're doing on reversing Alzheimer's. Your skin gets more blood, so you age less quickly, you look 10 or 20 years younger. Your heart gets more blood, we showed for the first time you could actually reverse even severe heart disease. Your sexual organs get more blood flow. And so it kind of reframes this whole idea of like, okay, I'm, I'm you know, you know, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I eat a, a, a you know, a plant-based diet? And reframe that to say, look, this is how you enjoy life more fully. You have more energy. You have better sex. You have, you know, hotter sex in a cooler planet. You know, all these <laughs> matter come together in this way. And the genetics is just one of the many mechanisms that helps explain that. So let's get. I think I remember you briefly saying in the last video that we were able to see even some gene expression changes from sort of mental shifts, was that correct or incorrect? No, it's correct. There was a study that came out from Jeff Dusick at Harvard uh, where they looked at changes in meditation, uh, changes in gene expression due to meditation. And again, to set the context, you know, in our program, people, you have to eat. It's just, I mean, it's eat well, move more, stress less, love more. You have to eat. So it's just a question of what you eat. Most people know that exercise is good and it really feels like, you know, you're out there really doing something. Um, and loving more, people uh, obviously get the benefit of that. But like meditation, well, I don't know. I, I'm a busy person. I've got a thousand things to do. Why should I just sit there with my eyes closed when I've got all this stuff to do? It doesn't look like it's doing much. It looks like you're just sitting there with your eyes closed. So this one study found that just meditation, they looked at non-meditators, people who were taught to meditate for eight weeks, and what they called advanced meditators, people who had been doing it for a year or more. And they found there was this dose-response effect that meditation alone changed the gene expression in over 300 genes. Again, always you know, turning off the bad genes, turning on the good genes. Um, and there was some improvement after eight weeks and even more improvement in gene expression after a year, uh, both in terms of upregulating the good genes and downregulating the bad genes. And it just, again, shows that it may look like you're not doing much when you meditate, but just how powerful these simple te techniques can be, again, in only eight weeks. And probably these changes occur even before that. And would you say that that might be, if you're looking physiologically at the stress response, you know, people are lowering, maybe lowering their cortisol levels of stress and, and things like that. Maybe that's signaling how genes should be expressed, or do you think there's another explanation for it? I think that's, that's, that's you're right, that's part of it, but it's more than that. Um, there are proteins that turn genes on and turns off. They're like switches. And as we talked about earlier, if you can turn off a gene that causes you to get sick, then it's as though you change your genes. Functionally, it, you, it is as though you change your genes. And glycation is another process in which the sugar in your bloodstream uh, attaches to 
fats and proteins, and they form these really harmful molecules that cause things like oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is when your electrons like to travel in pairs, like people do. And if you take one away because of you know something like um, radiation that's knocked one of those things out, for example, or uh, whatever, then your body will try to extract that another electron from something else, which can cause damage to the DNA. And glycation is a natural process in which the sugar in your bloodstream attaches to fats and proteins, and it forms these highly um, oxidant, which makes them harmful molecules, which cause oxidative stress. And they're, those are called advanced glycation end products, which have the perfect acronym of AGE, age. which uh, makes you age. And the age suppresses this sirtuin activity. In other words, it, it turns off the switches which are um, w w that turn off the harmful genes that cause us to age. So in a sense, sirtuins are anti-aging because they turn off the aging molecules that cause you to age faster and, and increase your risk of getting a lot of different things. And they, they contribute to cross oxidative stress, inflammation, and again, it's just another example of how all these things uh, interact with each other. And they may also contribute to dementia and to Alzheimer's as well, as well as kidney disease and heart disease and, and lots of other things. I mean, oxidative stress is implicated in every major disease is the big quote. So if you can if you can work with that, then you're doing good. And so, you know, in foods that are high, it's just another example of why a, a plant-based diet is good for you because um, both the type of the food and how it's cooked affect these age molecules. You know, animal-based proteins that are high in fat and high in protein, high in sugar, um, are rich in age. And they, and they also, um, when you cook them, when you like char broil them, for example, um, they, they, it, they, it creates even more of them. Whereas the, the whole grains, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and so on, are relatively low in ages, even after you cook them. So again, they not only are not bad for you, but they're actually protective. And that's the theme we keep coming back to, is that when you switch from a, a, a traditional standard American diet, you know, SAD diet, speaking of acronyms, to a whole foods plant-based diet, this is just another of the many mechanisms by which you get this double benefit. You're not only not doing the things that cause you to age faster and get sick easier, you're doing lots of things that actually are protective. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of substances and fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes that, you know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genesine, lycopene, et cetera, that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, and anti-aging properties. And these are the some of the mechanisms which make that true. Okay. So I want to talk about the two diseases. We talked about cancer enough. So let's, let's step into heart disease for a second here. Are there any genes in particular that we know of, maybe important genes or or just what's happening with epigenetics and heart disease when people are changing their lifestyle? Well, it's the same thing. You know, you're, you're, there's a genetic variability in how efficiently your body can metabolize dietary fat and cholesterol. And it's a bell curve like so many things in medicine. On one end of the spectrum, you have people who are super efficient and they, they can eat almost anything. They're never going to get heart disease. Those are the people who live to be 100. And you say, what do you eat? And they say, oh, I have, you know, 12 cheeseburgers every day. And you think, well, gosh, maybe diet and make much difference they're look what they're eating and they're 100 but everyone else who was eating that kind of unhealthy diet and wasn't super efficient in metabolizing it for genetic reasons never made it to 100 that's who you're it's a selected group on the other end of the bell curve are people who generally have heart disease or high cholesterol levels and they're generally inefficient for genetic reasons and the genetic reasons is are that they're what are called ldl receptors on the cell membrane of your cells and they bind and remove ldl cholesterol from your blood and the more receptors you have, the more efficiently your body can do that. And again, the more receptors you have, you're, you're going to be on the, in, the efficient end of that spectrum. People with heart disease tend to be on the inefficient end. But even if you're not very efficient in metabolizing dietary fat and cholesterol, if you're not eating very much of it, then those differences don't matter. That's why Colin Campbell and others found that in China 50 or 60 years ago, they had almost no heart disease, even though they have the same genetic variability as we have in this country, because it wasn't expressed. Uh, you know, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, uh, prostate, breast, and colon cancer were a fraction of what they are. But then over the last 50 years, as they started to eat like us and live like us, then all too often they start to die like us. And so heart disease and diabetes are killing more people in those countries now than, than anything else, what they call uh, non-communicable diseases. Because now those genes are expressing themselves because they're now getting challenged with a lot more 
fat and cholesterol and other substances that they're not able to metabolize, at least certain parts of the population are, because just like in this country, you have a certain number of people who don't have very many LDL receptors, they're not very efficient, and now that they're getting more in their diet, if you're eating more than your body can get rid of, it tends to build up in your arteries, and that in turn can lead to all these chronic conditions we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. I've got an interesting question I just thought of, um, and it's going to have to be speculation, but do you think there is an evolutionary reason that we have, like, why would we have these genes that you can turn off and then kill you from an evolutionary perspective? If you have any thoughts on that, let me know. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think our body has evolved in ways that are designed to keep us alive, but in modern times, those same mechanisms that are really evolved to protect us can actually harm us or even kill us. And the most common, often cited example is the fight or flight response. You know, your body's designed for intermittent stress. So that if you're walking along in the jungle and the mythical saber-toothed tiger jumps out at you, then all these hormones start to kick in. Your stress hormones, you mentioned, you know, uh, adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol, et cetera. Your sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive, so your arteries constrict, your muscles tighten up, your eye pupils dilate so you can see better. So you can run, or you, I mean, it's about fight or flight. You can kill the tiger, you can run away from it. But one way or another, the, the, the it's over. And so if the tiger bites you, for example, you want your arteries to constrict uh, because you don't bleed as quickly if you get injured or you want the blood to clot faster so for the same reason but but the but it's an intermittent stress you, you know either you run away or you kill the tiger or it eats you one way or another it's over it's not relentless and chronic but in modern times you wake up and you know you hear you know some horrible political things been going on kids being taken away from their parents at the border or whatever it happens to be and then you, you know you you get to breakfast and your kid tells you something horrible, and then you, it's one series of stresses after another. And so these, these, the fight or flight response is chronically activated. So now it's not just the arteries in your arms and legs that constrict or the blood clotting there in case the, you get wounded in battle or getting bitten by a tiger. It's the one in your arteries in your heart, you know. And so now your arteries in your heart are constricting and blood is clotting there, and that can lead to a heart attack. And so the same is true for diet. You know, we've evolved to be able to, I mean, you, you know, until we had refrigerators and freezers, even if you were a hunter, you, you didn't eat meat all the time. You, you, you know, you had to kill an animal and then you feasted for a day or so and then it went bad and then spent another week or two trying to find another one. It wasn't like three times a day you're eating more fat and cholesterol than your body can get rid of. And so our bodies have evolved in some ways. I mean, the, the new at Eskimo can eat a lot of blubber because... That's, that's what they eat. So the, those people who weren't very good at metabolizing that much fat and cholesterol didn't live long enough in many cases to, to have offspring. So it tends to select for people who are more efficient at metabolizing those things. So there is a, an evolutionary selection bias. But the, the, the modern era that we're living in is very different than the hundreds of thousands or millions of years that we've had leading up to this point. And that's caused these same mechanisms that really have evolved to protect us can now often become harmful and even lethal. And that's why we need to go back to a diet that we've really evolved to eat and a way of living that really involves much more community and trying to mitigate stress rather than just simply uh, to be overcome by it. Nowadays, your diet is the tiger. <laughs> and more than that. Tiger, I like that. Also. All right, so you're all about lifestyle in general. It's diet, it's a lot of things. So is there anything about exercise and epigenetics that's worth talking about? Yeah, you know, exercise makes you smarter at uh, at any age. It uh, makes your brain bigger as well. Uh, several studies have shown that just walking a half an hour a day uh, can cause so much new brain growth. You know, and, you know, again, when I was in medical school, which wasn't that long ago, we were told that you only get a certain number of brain cells, and if you go out and have a couple of six packs and kill off a few thousand of them, you never get them back. It turns out your brain is one of the most dynamic organisms, and that just walking for a half an hour a day caused so much new brain growth that people's brains got bigger, particularly in the hippocampus, the part of your brain that controls memory. You know, oftentimes when, when people get older, they start to think like, you know, what was that guy's name or where do I leave my keys? You know, little things like that. And a lot of that turns out to be reversible. Uh, we're doing now the first randomized trial to see if we can reverse uh, early stage Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm, I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very much like we were 40 years ago with heart disease. There's every reason to think that less intensive interventions have been shown to slow down the rate at which you get worse. We think a more intensive intervention may actually reverse it because, again, Alzheimer's has these same underlying mechanisms that all these other chronic diseases do. So stay tuned about that. But it's been shown, for example, that children who exercise in school have better grades. They um, 
you know, uh, after just 12 weeks of, of exercise. And, and the benefits of exercising when you start when you're young continue that um, those who are active when they're in their, you know, in their teens process information factor when they get into their 60s. Um, and it's both the duration and the intensity and the type of exercise that improve uh, cognitive function. And one of the reasons is that exercise increases what's called autophagy or autophagy, depending on how you pronounce it. And that's just your body's way of getting rid of toxic substances in your brain. And it's one of the reasons why exercise helps to prevent dementia, including uh, Alzheimer's. And fathers who exercise, even if they don't start working out until they're adults, have smarter babies, which is really great. I, w I had our first child when I was in my mid-40s, uh, and, um, uh, and, and our kids are smarter than we are, which is great. And, and what's also great is that they, they, your kids, in turn, pass along those benefits, brain benefits of physical activity to their kids through this process that we've been talking about called epigenetics. I mean, even in, um, it changes the brains and the sperm of, of men and animals in ways that later affect the, the brains and thinking of their, of, their, uh, of their offspring. It doesn't even take that much. You know, just standing instead of sitting, for example, can make a difference. One study showed that just people who were standing perform better on a test than those who were sitting, you know, uh, it's, it's like thinking on your feet gives a whole new meaning to it. Uh, and so when you practice these things, you can actually show improvements which just in weeks to months and actually in your brain function. Uh, another way to do that is by changing what you eat. You know, um, when you do intermittent fasting, that can help reduce these age molecules that cause your, your brain to age faster. Uh, just one of the easiest ways to do it is try to eat an early dinner, try to have your bigger meals earlier in the day, try to be done by eating by six or seven. Don't eat anything more until you have breakfast at seven or eight the next morning. You get a 12 to 13 hour fast. It's an easy way to do it. Another is to try to eat less fat because fat has nine calories per gram and protein and carbs have only four. So if you go from eating a 40 or 50 or these days sometimes a 70 or 80 percent fat diet to 10 or 15 percent, even if you eat the same amount of food, you're getting a lot fewer calories because the food is less dense in calories. It has only four calories per gram instead of nine. So you're eating the same amount of food, you're getting fewer calories. And when you're getting fewer calories, you're getting the benefit of the one thing that's been shown to extend lifespan is to reducing the caloric intake, but you're able to do it in a way that doesn't feel de deprived because you're still eating the same amount of food. You can eat whenever you're hungry, but you're eating food that's less dense in calories, and so that helps you age more slowly. And those benefits, in turn, get passed on to your kids as well. You've got to get that fiber, too. And I, I, I can't help, I had to think earlier about the alcohol. So now you can just you just have to drink while you walk. <laughs> so obviously, I don't support alcohol consumption. It's a health channel. Well, actually, uh, you know, studies have, I mean, I live in California where marijuana is legal, mm -hmm. and some studies have shown that cannabinoids in marijuana actually promote neurogenesis as yep. well. Yeah, I did a whole video on uh, marijuana, you know, is it healthy or is it unhealthy? And uh, I had somebody responded by saying, THC causes brain damage. You're like, it was like Mike the Vegan is all caps wrong. Yeah. And, um, but then I, I looked at the studies and it, it was showing there was neuroprotective effects. But they also said there were some potential neurodamaging effects, but there's no overall overall negative effect proven okay, in that the, area. The net effect actually is a good one. It promotes neurogenesis. And I, you know, it actually is the, the CBD. Uh, uh, especially when you look at the whole entourage effect of all these different cannabinoids, when you take out the psychoactive THC, has been really powerful in reducing seizures in many people um, much more effectively and with much fewer side effects than the uh, anti-seizure medications. You heard it directly from Dean Orner, smoke weed every day. I'm joking. Exactly. <laughs> it's very much not what he said. I'm, I'm sorry, what were, we just, what were we just talking about? Never mind. <laughs> yeah, what were we? yeah, totally kidding. Um, yeah, uh, one more thing you, you mentioned a little bit about calorie restriction in general, and I kind of like to tread lightly on this topic and a little bit on intermittent fasting, as I mentioned in my intermittent fasting video, just cause there's so much eating disorder behavior here and people with a lot of issues there and, and that yes. can trigger, but assuming you don't have eating disorders talking about calorie restriction, how does that affect epigenetics? Well, caloric restriction is one of the things that affects the age molecule that we've been talking about. And that's just one of many of the sirtuins that we've been talking about. But again, Caloric restriction in the way that I'm referring to doesn't involve eating disorders because it's not about reducing the amount of food, it's more the type of food. And if you can eat food that's less dense in calories by reducing the fat and sugar in your diet, then you can eat whenever you're hungry, you can eat till you're full and still lose weight. We found the average person in our studies, in our randomized trials, lost 24 pounds in the first year 
actually better weight loss data than Weight Watchers, but we're not focusing on weight, we're focusing on health. And as you know, there are lots of ways of losing weight, like going on a, you know, an Atkins, paleo, keto diet, et cetera, where you can lose weight, but you're mortgaging your health. Or process. chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, you know, smoking cigarettes, yeah. being depressed, there are lots of ways of losing weight that aren't good for you. Yeah. But in this way, you can, losing weight is almost a side effect of eating a healthy diet, in which case everything gets better, including but not limited to weight loss. All right, so in your book, you talk about love more. For you, that seems almost to be what you're most excited about in all of this, is the love more aspect. And so my question is, is there any tangible epigenetic results from loving more? Uh, there are, actually. You know, one study showed that just people who watched uh, videos of people doing loving, compassionate things like Mother Teresa ministering to the poor in Calcutta, uh, it changed their gene expression after just watching this film. It's amazing how dynamic these mechanisms are. And I guess, you know, when you say love more is, is the part I seem to get most excited about. I'm excited about all of that. But the reason I like that is because it really goes to the heart of, you know, what it means to be alive. You know, I, we talked before about how I was suicidally depressed when I was in college. That's how I got interested in doing all this work. And you look in the political scene and what's going on in the world and how much darkness there is. It's, just, it's so easy to over, feel overwhelmed. Like, you know, what can I do as one person that can make a difference? And then when you realize something as primal as like what you eat every day um, can make a difference, not only in your life, but the life of other people. You know, what's good for you is good for the planet. What's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. You know, it takes 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein than plant-based protein. There's enough food to feed everybody. I mean, no one need go hungry. And I, we live in the Bay Area where it's such an affluent place. And yet one out of, I went on the board of the San Francisco Food Bank a few years ago when I learned that one out of five kids goes hungry here. It's, 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 it's inexcusable. It's pitiful. Um, and then we look at global warming where more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. So whether it's feeding the hungry or you know, trying to, you know, keep us all alive by reducing global warming, as well as what's good for you and your own body, and, and then through epigenetics for what's good for your kids, we realize that these choices that we make empower us, and can, and they, we imbue them with meaning. And if they're meaningful, then they're sustainable. One of the things my wife talks about in the new book is like, we go, we've gotten the habit of asking people, you know, why do you want to make these lifestyle changes? And people invariably say, oh, I want to live longer. And you say, well, why do you want to live longer? She'll ask, or I'll ask. And they say, well, well gosh, no one's ever asked me that before. I don't know. I want to uh, watch my kids grow up. I want to dance at their wedding. I want to, whatever it happens to be. My, my son just graduated a few days ago from high school, so I know what that feels like. Um, and then when you can get, there's a wonderful book that was written 50 years ago by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning, where they looked at concentration camp survivors in World War II. And they found that the ones that survived weren't necessarily the strongest or the healthiest. You could have two people in the same bunker, one lived and one died. And the one who lived, you know, invariably would say things like, I, I, I had to survive so that I could whatever, get reunited with my loved ones or bear witness, whatever it happened to be. So if you can get people, I, I learned I could take all the meaning out of something when I was in college. You know, who cares and so what and big deal and nothing matters and why bother? And I was ready to, 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 to die and kill myself when I was 19 years old. Uh, a lot of people are. You know, the, the real epidemic in our country is depression and loneliness. And so often the you know, they smoke or overeat or abuse opioids or work too hard or play too many video games as a way of coping with that pain. So we've learned that it's not enough to just focus on behaviors or information, that we need to deal with these deeper issues. And then when people realize that they can imbue those choices with meaning, that choosing to eat a plant-based diet or be in a healthy relationship with someone actually makes your life more pleasurable, more erotic, more joyful, more pleasurable in ways that really matter and how quickly you can experience those and to reconnect you with that sense of meaning and joy and love, then sometimes even people who got interested in making these changes because they got sick will say things like, you know, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me. You kind of want to go, what, are you nuts? And they say, no, that's what it took to get my attention to make these lame changes that have completely transformed my life and made it so much more joyful and meaningful that I might not have done before. And that's why your podcast is so important because you're really – empowering people with information that can really transform their lives and shine a light in that darkness and the light drives out the darkness and there's so much darkness in our world now you know you're really a bright light and we all need to shine that light and uh, it's never been more badly Thank needed you. appreciate it um but i do want to really quickly jump back to this idea and unpack um you know somebody watching a video of say mother Teresa or some other doing you know good deed or whatever um, could it be, looking at it from evolutionary perspective of, you know, we're social creatures, we're picking up 
on that sort of like social tribal peacefulness, which then would downregulate any stress responses or expressions of genes that, you know, going back to the the blood clotting genes and stuff like that. So Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. But I think it goes even beyond that. Not only are you not turning on the genes that cause these uh, fight or flight responses that can be destructive, but there are, for lack of a better word, love genes that actually are protective. That when you put yourself in a loving, compassionate place, it actually generates healing responses in your body that go beyond just stopping the negative influences to ones that are actually positive and even healing. Love it. Love genes. That's the name of your next book, you know, <laughs> down the line. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much for that knowledge blast. If you like what you heard at all, go and check out his book. Go and buy his book. Undo it. It'll be the first link in the description. Hit it up. Learn that knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Dean Ornish, for blessing us with your knowledge again. Oh, great pleasure.